What I have planned for us is first, you are gonna to have to do a little work. So in your yellow orange folder, there is um, uh, that little sheet of paper that should look something like that size. You find it? You have about two minutes, and I'm not kidding. You're gonna to have to do this quick. Some of you have one dot, some have two, some have three. Hold that card up, look at it in a number of ways. What do you see beyond the dot? What is there? Imagine more than dots and draw it. And seriously, you have about two minutes, so draw it fast. Does everyone have a pen? Everybody has a folder. Okay. Oh, you need a folder. Okay. Yeah, we'll get you a folder. No, it's totally unfair. I get the easiest job. <laughs> you have about 40 seconds left, so turn it into something. Okay, 15 more seconds. All right, I know it's quick, it's totally fine, but what I'm gonna need you to do is pair, so get one or two, maybe three um, people around you, two, two's probably, a group of three would be too big, or try to get in a group, two to three, two to three is fine. And what I want you to do is just share. But what I want you to show them is what did you draw? And then how did you come up with the idea? So quickly cluster and just share really quickly with your cluster. So you may have to move, sorry. We're, we're gonna, but it's late, so I wanna get you moving. It, it, it'll help with processing. Okay, make sure both people have shared now, not just one. Um, let's make sure both have been able to quickly share. Okay, what I wanna have happen next is you've just probably met someone new and some of you may be like, man, in two minutes, that's pretty cool what they did. So I'd love for you to, if you had something like that happen, nominate the buddy that you had to maybe hold up their drawing and tell us a little bit about why you thought it was cool. Okay, I'm getting some pointing here. Are you nominating her? Yeah, yeah good. I, I didn't say this would be painless, but you know. So what did you draw? I, um, I drew a, a motorcycle uh, running through some bugs. Nice. Some splatters, yeah, excellent, excellent. Anybody else, okay, oh, you're nominating him, excellent. <laughs> I love that you had to create an energy for your classroom um, to describe, oh, even more. Oh wow, fabulous, fabulous. Somebody else, has someone they wanna nominate? 
they nominated you. Please tell us what you drew. Yeah, <laughs> with that sun glowing in the middle there. Yes, brilliant. Okay, you can see a lot of different things were drawn. This is gonna come up later, but I wanted you to experience it so when we see it later, you have a sense of memory around this. Um, tonight I'm gonna talk about thinking like an artist. What does this mean and how am I thinking about art education a little differently from maybe what we're typically used to and why I'm framing it around this idea of thinking like an artist. So there's going to be three parts to what I present. One, I'm going to make a case. I'm going to try to convince you of this future vision that I have around the role of art education in society. I'm going to share examples, in particular intentionality around this work, and then I'm gonna help you think about, um, help you vision your role in cultivating a more curious, connected, and creative Jacksonville or central Jacksonville area, okay? So let's begin. As Cedric mentioned, I did a TED Talk. Um, I will tell you it was most, one of the most horrifying moments of my life. I'm, I'm glad I lived through it. Um, what I did not expect is, you know, what I would learn after the fact. So while I did do a TED Talk, tonight is really what came after that talk. In particular, what I've learned from educators and from artists and leaders about what this idea was that I was presenting. So I just wanted to frame that for you. You can go back and see the talk if you'd like, but tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about what sense. But it all started off with a one pager. Have any of you ever been asked by your boss, um, like I was, Cindy, I just need a one pager. And usually that's like, oh, okay, fine, I, you know, I'll do it. I was asked years ago, about 10 years ago, to create a one pager around what was the purpose and value of arts learning in the museum I worked in. We were about to start a capital campaign and my boss asked me, here's, here's the kicker. She asked me on a, like a Friday late afternoon, and I was about to leave that Saturday morning for vacation. She needed it, you know, when I got back, it's okay, just, you know, have it when you get back. So the entire drive, and I'm driving out to Provincetown, Massachusetts. Has anybody ever been to Provincetown? Oh, a couple hands, excellent. So I'm driving out to Province Ma Provincetown, Massachusetts. I wanna get this thing done. So, you know, quickly writing. The entire time I'm writing, all of the stuff I typically would have written in grad school. You know, the purpose and value of museum learning. Of course, I'd, I'd written that. It was because art has stories to tell and it's important for those next generations to be able to hear those stories. Or um, museums are places of value and we need people to value them. But it felt really flat and it felt disingenuous. You know what it felt like as I was writing? We need people to like art museums, so I have a job in the future, is what it felt like. And I think it felt that way because if you haven't been to Provincetown, the place that I was going is an artist colony. It's where for decades, artists have come to work together, to think together, to have new ideas, to spar, to be creative. It's also one of the, the craziest um, um, uh, uh, places um, in the, it's fun. But I think it had a real impact on my thinking. So instead, I did not come back with a one pager. I came back with a belief that maybe the purpose and value of arts learning needed to be something different. And it needed to focus on creativity. And it was because I was thinking so much about this place where artists have been thinking and creating for decades. So I um, proposed to my boss that if we were to start this capital campaign, we needed to put some energy around creativity. That we actually needed that to be the core purpose of our work, creativity. And she said, fantastic, um, I can get behind this. So are we doing that? Are we actually making people creative? And over the next 18 months, I had the most difficult time of probably my work life where we evaluated and assessed if we were really going to do that. 
80% of our programs would have to go away. So what you're hearing today is kind of the story of the shift that we made. The reason I'm maybe in this visionary space is because I presented an idea and my boss actually said, then let's do it. And I had to live up to this new idea. So making the case, when she decided we were going to do this, she said, I don't want it to be um, just face value. I don't want us to talk about creativity, but actually not be practicing it ourselves. I also think we need to have a lot more research and evidence. Here are some of the things. Okay, so here's the museum. Um, I should kind of say, for those of you who are educators, museums are a lot like schools. We've done things that way for a very long time. We have held on to traditions that are maybe, I don't wanna say asinine, but really backwards um, for a very long time. Schools and museums aren't that different because we focused, when it came to learning, we focused on content. We focused on, as you can see here, schools filling the vessels with information. Here's a photo from a museum in about 1940, the same time this photo was taken, or, well, it's 1960s. But needless to say, we've been filling people with content. We wanted them to learn about our stuff and value our stuff. But here's a crazy thing. This is this great diagram I found from the late 1800s, where already in the 1800s, they were questioning, why in the world are we trying to just fill the brains of humans? This is not capitalizing on their great capacity. So this was a big joke, even in the late 1800s, that schools and places of learning were just about filling people with content. Upon making this shift at the museum, I can tell you our museum does look different today. We um, focused on the people first, and we had to begin thinking about what would their learning need to look like. So how would we begin to allow for not only for them to learn about the content of what we had, but to engage as learners within that space? The big thing was my boss said, I don't wanna do this again if it's just to get some funds. We need to put our money where our mouth is. What would that look like? And that's when we decided we would open an 18,000 square foot center for creativity. It would be on the first floor of our primary museum and it would be not only our programming stream, it would be our philosophy and a center space. When we opened it though, the most important thing I can tell you that we had to decide is what we even meant by this word creativity. So for purposes of tonight, it is critically important that you know what I'm talking about. So for us, and there are over a hundred definitions of creativity, all of them valid, once you get to the point where you're thinking more about creativity, you may need to mine them and figure out which one feels right to you, but this is where we landed. Creativity is the process of using the imagination and critical thinking. So remember, the, imagine is the imagination is the ability to conceive of what is not. Critical thinking is the ability to make sense of all the, the, the things that are coming at us, to analyze, synthesize, but it's the process of using the imagination and critical thinking to generate new ideas that have value. So very important there, new ideas. New ideas that have value. When I started to make the case, there were a couple documents that I was using all the time. Here's one of them. Um, this was around uh, uh, the, you know, it was, I think 2009. And we were having lots of conversations about 21st century skills. And this was a document I found that really analyzed the 20th century versus the 21st century. So what they were saying is, if you look on the left, number of jobs in a lifetime. In the 20th century, so my parents are in their 60s and 70s, on average, 
most people had one to two jobs in their lifetime. That was the average. What they are estimating for the 21st century is that on average, people will have between 10 and 15 jobs. Not, I was a teacher and then I moved to a different school or I moved to a different kind of teaching. Like, totally different jobs. What they're predicting is that for many, when you graduate from high school or college, the work that you do upon graduation may not even exist by the time you retire. So what does that mean? Well, that means we have to shift some things. One of them is the education model. No longer is it gonna be sufficient to just have degrees, like check boxes. We have to move towards being lifetime, lifelong learners. The job requirement, you can no longer master a field. My mom was a teacher, my dad was an attorney. They mastered their field and they could do that the rest of their careers. It no longer will work. You'll have to be constantly learning something new, updating yourself, changing throughout your lifetime. So this document was really helpful in, in shifting um, people's perceptions about what the world needs moving forward. Here were some other um, incredible, I was doing a lot of reading. So here is a study um, that was uh, given by NASA. NASA was trying to determine how to analyze all the applicants that come in and through NASA. And they were giving them a creativity test. And what was amazing is this study was showing that on average, um, they would get about 2% of the adults taking that test were scoring at an exceptional, brilliant level. On a lark, they decided, what if we were to give these to kids? And what they showed is that 98% of children actually mark as brilliant at creativity. What they realized is non-creative behavior is something that we learn. We're learning how to not be creative. Other documents that were incredibly helpful, if you haven't read um, or if you haven't heard about um, uh, a lot of the work around questioning, they are doing a ton of research around what happens to children's questioning. And what this showed is that um, questioning, kids questioning drops off in unbelievable ways, starting at three years old, often when they're introduced to formal education of some sort. Here's a statistic that is horrifying. On average, the average child asks 125, anybody have a toddler in their world right now? Yeah, so you're, you're gonna be <laughs> very much agreeing. Um, asks 125 probing questions a day. The average adult, Ask a mere six, six questions a day versus 125. There's been some incredible research by the um, A More Beautiful Question. Warren Berger believes that the future of learning is not about content at all, that we will eventually have to pull back significantly around the content because what can we do to find out answers to content? We can Google content. The challenge we have today is that children don't know how to ask beautiful questions. So this um, sometimes even uh, upsets me if I get emotional, um, no, I'll get through it. But I found that Susan Ingle, she's been doing tons of research. She had a very well-funded study for um, three months. She was gonna be embedded in kindergarten, and fifth grade schools in, I, it was in the state of Massachusetts. Um, they started the research and she, she wanted to do this because here's her quote, research has shown over and over the kids learn best when they are seeking the answers to their own questions. The study was canceled. And Susan says it turned out to be impossible because there was such an astonishing low rate of curiosity in any of the classrooms we visited. 
You may have seen this on the cover of Newsweek. You can still download this report and you can actually get all the raw data, uh, which is something like a three, 400 page report as well if you're interested. But what the um, um, Time or Newsweek um, article really kind of brought to everyone's attention is that there have been two tests that are administered across the globe every year. And that's the IQ test, you're all familiar with that. The other one is called the Torrance Test for Creativity. Both of those tests are given across the globe and it's been going on for decades and decades and decades. What they found, um, starting even as early as the 1950s, is that something extraordinary happened in the United States that didn't happen anywhere else. And when kids were tested on these two tests, in the United States, we bumped up here in the United, we, we bumped up 10 points in IQ every decade and 10 points on the Torrance creativity test. And that happened decade after decade after decade. Nowhere else was it happening. In the 1970s, it became so aware that we had countries coming to try to determine how were we making these unbelievable gains. Until the 1990s. And in the 1990s, they found that IQ scores continued to raise in the United States. Creativity scores here began to plummet. Anyone in the room want to guess what could be happening in the 1990s that would cause? <laughs> you can say it loud. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, so they give lots of reasons, but... Yes, it was the introduction of standardized testing. And No Child Left Behind wasn't meant to be that. It was meant to level things out. It was meant to do some good things, but it had a very negative after effect. There are a lot of other factors though that they call on in the report. Anybody else have some ideas about what could have? Technology. Yep, so the introduction of, in particular, passive screen time. Screens in and of themselves, they found, weren't the problem. It was the passive nature of screens, whether that was television or higher levels of technology, gaming, etc. There's one other big factor. is the limited play, the limited scope of play. And what we started to see in the 1990s is that parents became far more aware of the horrible things that could happen to their children. If you think about it, that's when we started to see news reports and, and the whole gnarly um, what could happen to your child was put on the news every night. The interesting thing is the 1990s were a lot safer than the 1970s when I grew up. But what we did is we started pulling our kids out of free play. So what you had is you had a lot of more kids in front of screens and a lot of more kids who weren't on the playgrounds um, are meeting up their buddies or playing in the, the, um, the creek behind the house. They were either engaged activities, all facilitated by adults, or they were in front of screens. So quickly we started to see less and less play, open-ended play. They interpreted this as a crisis that in 2009, it was deemed a crisis for the United States. Here's another, um, if you follow the Future of Jobs report, it comes out, I think every 10, five, five to 10 years, five, yeah, five years. And in 2015, creativity made the list. And it was the first time the Future of Jobs report had indicated that creativity had to be on the list for what we need um, for future jobs and success, the skills aligned with that. But in five years, we had the biggest jump. They've seen one of the biggest jumps. So creativity is now number three. They're predicting in the next report, it will be number one. Remember, it's the ability to have ideas and to do something with them. Um, this was a, something I just saw uh, a couple weeks, months ago. Um, the Brookings report. Uh, it was an article, Beyond the Midterms, Helping Students Overcome the Impact of No Child Left Behind. And I just want to read this quote. Today's college juniors are the first of students who spent their entire public education under No Child Left Behind. Research shows that while these students are very good at memorizing facts, and we know this, they struggle to write essays and to communicate their ideas clearly. We're finding more and more of this evidence building. 
So this is pretty strong evidence. I was really working to make a case for why we needed to open a center for creativity. Should do the trick, right? Compelling to me. Well, there was something I didn't factor in. And what I didn't factor are the mythologies that surround creativity. And we all, we're in the arts. We all experience them. So these are not going to surprise you, but they are um, very intentional ways for me to tell you, even with all the evidence, until we can kill some of these myths, we can make no gains. So let's talk about what the number one myth of creativity might be. And of course, it depends on what you Google, but um, uh, it, I, I love to use Google as a quick assessment. And what Google told me is this, that creativity comes from creative types, right? And this was from a Fast Company report. And if you then Google, well, who are creative types? This, these are the kind of images that pop up. Um, we don't have time to talk about the fact that they're all white males, that's for another talk, but um, what is very clear is that what we see up here is that a belief that only certain people are creative, right? That's incredibly problematic. What do artists actually say about who is creative? Let me give you three of my favorite quotes by some artists who have opinions on this. So let's take Picasso. He, he actually popped up in one of those other images. And you will know this quote, I'm sure. Every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. My Angelo, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. Or probably my favorite right now in the given time we're in is Joseph Boys. Every human being is an artist, a freedom being called to participate in transforming and reshaping the conditions, thinking, and structures that inform our lives. Artists know it is not about who's born with it and who's not. It's about practicing it and doing it every day and being intentional. That, of course, artists do well. But what we have to do is realize that's not something that you're born with. Okay, here's my number one most challenging um, myth I've had to buff, bust, bust, sorry. That art skill is equal to creativity. Now remember, when I opened a center for creativity, I would have people coming up to me on a daily basis saying, Cindy, this is so wonderful. We're so glad that you're opening this for the children. Usually they'd say the children. I mean, I'm not creative. I can't even draw a stick figure is what I would hear hundreds of times. And here's the issue with that. Drawing has absolutely nothing to do with creativity. Drawing is a means to get an idea out into the world. Painting is a means to get an idea out in the world. Cooking is a means to get an idea out in the world. Essay writing is a means to get an idea out in the world, right? My friend Amanda, who I work with, I will be sitting in a meeting and I will see her face change when we're on a complex problem. She will go back to her office and I will know she's about to get an idea out into the world using Microsoft Excel. It is our medium and she is a master. But if we think about it, that's what all sorts of things are. Art just happens to be a form of getting ideas out into the world. Artists do that really well. What do artists have to say about this? I love this top one. Painting, this is George Brock, is a nail to which I fasten my ideas. Or of course, Damien Hirst, the idea is more important than the object. So I'm gonna have this watch two um, commercials. They are clearly trying to sell us something, but they're going about it by getting at something emotional. And what I want to talk about is how they may be talking about creativity. So they're just about a minute apiece. Let's start with the first one. I have always wanted you to help. Do you 
you know why? I have to figure it out on my own. Okay, just out of curiosity, anybody get tear up um, seeing it? And no, just me. <laughs> um, but why does it pull on the? What is it about that commercial that pulls on the heartstrings? Anyone want to venture a thought? Yeah. And I think, I think you just nailed it. It's, it's the fact that there's a lost, there's this lost like element of childhood. She's having to ask, right? Like, just let me, right? And you think about what happens in education and you know, what, are we losing those kids? So thank you. The next commercial is a slightly different kind of mood, but I want you to think about this one in relationship to creativity too. You may have seen it. Tell them I'm creators. Those with the need to make something new. Who are obsessed with progress. Creativity is everything in today's game. It's about making a statement. I think what we're all trying to do is be my mark so the game will never be the same. The game will never, never be the same. We're all creators. Related by a mindset. That's our job to continue to try to enlighten the world and inspire. We take an example of it. But no, I have to create for myself. It's <laughs> <laughs> not about borders, gender, or race. I ain't trying to stay in my I'm trying to strike while I'm here. It's all in our twine. Fashion inspires music. Art, design, sport together. Come on, Hopkins. You know you listen to Pushy Teeth and Pushy Teeth. And everybody, maybe you should. <laughs> George. George. Pull up a chair. Let's change sports. Let's change lives. Let's create. Let's create. <laughs> Okay, so what are they, what is that commercial all about? I can Right, well, and in a lot of ways, what you have up here, sports figures, anybody recognize one? Yep. Yeah. You have um, uh, designers, there are uh, th three, a graphic designer and two fashion designers, um, and musicians. And, but they're all saying the same thing. What, do, what, do you, what are they trying to kind of get us to consider? Yeah, they don't it want, in all of them. yeah, it exists in all of them and they don't want the world to be the same. They want to push and that they, if they do it together, what can they produce? So granted, they're trying to sell Adidas, um, but I think it's really interesting Who's talking about creativity? And where, are the, where is the arts community? These are two of the most successful commercials about creativity that are trying to sell something by talking about the importance of creativity. So it's just something I don't have an answer to, but it is something we must consider. This is, I want you to think about, the first section was really about making the case. Here are some takeaways I want you to think about. The evidence is clear. There is just hundreds of research reports you can Google right now that teaching for creativity isn't just a good thing. It is a necessity for the future. The societal perceptions of art and creativity are counterproductive. We've got to change those. 
and we've got to do it, this bottom one, the arts must own creativity. Right now, you ask a lot of people and they'll tell you, oh, STEM is where creativity is at, right? Because the arts have not owned it in such a way. Um, and yet you can tell from both of those commercials, what's at the center of them? The arts. So my next section is on intentionality. How do we do this then? What does it look like if we wanna put creativity at the center of learning, to have a center for creativity? So I'm gonna have you flip your sheet of paper over and I want you to answer these two questions for me. It may take a little bit of recall for some of us, but I need you to go back in time. And I want you to name something you were deeply curious about. And on the left-hand side of the paper, I want you to write between the ages of five and 12. On the right-hand side of the paper, between the ages of 13 and 18. And by curious, I'm not just talking about passing curiosity, something you were pretty like, you checked out books, you really got into it, you would talk about it when, with people that maybe weren't as interested, but you tried to convince them of how cool it was. Think about something that you were deeply curious about. It could have been pop culture, it could have been natural world, anything. I'm only gonna give you 30 seconds to recall, so. Okay, did you jot something down? Everybody feel pretty confident? So what I'd love for you to do is, again, turn to your neighbor and share one of those curiosities. I may be a little embarrassing, it's okay, but just share what you were curious about as a child. So quickly share. Has everyone gotten to share? <clears throat> okay, I won't put any of you on the spot unless somebody really wants to share, which is totally fine. <laughs> you, you were willing to share? Tell me one of the, one of the things you wrote down. Love it, love it. So you'd beg to go and see I them and draw. Go, I, love I it. To go to the big cat sanctuary. And You've the, got books out of the library. Love it. Anyone want to have a different one they want to share? So I had a phase between five and 12 where I watched my artist school where the missionaries, so I would practice reading them. Okay, that and is my, my fascinating. <laughs> So yummy, that is excellent. I love it. Are you, what, what's your career now? I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, great, great. Okay, what else? How did your finger move? Like the whole pro How could I think about it? I love it. That's fabulous. All these are great. I will tell you, um, in order to do this, I, I asked my colleagues to share too. And of course, we got everything from, I was curious about Ant Hill's magic, boxcar children. It must not have been my era. I don't remember that. Um, road kills. Someone was really obsessed. Yep, I'm seeing a nod out here. Orca whale, Xena, princess warrior, warrior princess. Yep, some um, fans of that. 
On the high school side, um, I will admit I was the uh, PETA up there, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Um, <laughs> my colleague, of course, much cooler than me, was into the Beastie Boys and went really deep and uh, was obsessed. Um, American Sign Language, Cats the Musical, The Existence of Vampires and Fairies, Secret Languages and Codes. Curiosity is a beautiful thing, right? The Curiosity is that insatiable desire to know or understand something. I believe that are these curiosities in some way the secret to passionate creative lives? The more we have curiosities as children, does it prepare us for the lives we want to pursue as adults? And then if you think about that study where we can't even find curiosity in classrooms, how do we make that shift? How do we get back to curiosity being at the center? So the one of the things I'm gonna share with you is these are a lot of the questions we started asking ourselves upon opening a center for creativity. What we immediately did is we had to decide what are we gonna focus on? We had to be intentional. We looked at the artists in our collection as well as we interviewed about, um, about 40 living artists. And we asked them a series of questions to understand how artists and creativity, what those dispositions look like. We narrowed it down to nine. And these are what we call the, the think like an artist behaviors. These are behaviors that artists particularly practice. Now I'm gonna spend some time on a couple clumps of these, but I wanted you to see the whole nine that we focus on. And the important thing is, if you are gonna focus on creativity, you can't just generally say, I'm gonna focus on creativity. It's too broad of an umbrella. You have to boil it down to something you can be really intentional about. So it might be valuing influence and in collaboration. That's what they were talking about in the Adidas commercial, the importance of collaboration. Reflection and revis revision. Artists are really good at seeing something and reflecting on it and changing and changing. They're not um, stricken by what to do with that. So there's a lot on this list, but there's some I'm gonna focus on right now. One thing we did is we knew that if we wanted to be intentional, we had to make space for these things to happen in the museum that I work in. So, for example, up here, idea generation and reflection. We realized that in our old mastery gallery, many of the work in that gallery dealt with power, artists trying to portray power. So we started giving visitors an opportunity to tell us, join the conversation, reflect on this. What does power look like in our lives today? The lack of it or having it? So we started some conversations where you had to generate ideas. Or we, we were looking at, for example, this is a gallery of um, uh, um, art, <laughs> I'm missing the word right now, that deals with trick of the eye, you know, um, a lot of uh, some, yes, thank you, thank you, sorry. Yeah, so what we realized is the artists were incredibly intentional around playing with that, what we know our eyes do. So we decided, why don't we let our visitors play with the same kind of ideas? So you see they've got little boards down there with rubber bands and they can move the lines around to try to create different kinds of patterns. We also wanted to create opportunities for imagination, collaboration. So we put up a wall that said, imagine the possibilities. We put out a stack of twist ties on the first day. And within 24 hours, it filled our walls, people responding. Someone would make a fish, someone else would make a boat, someone else would make a bigger fish about to eat the other fish. And it just would start taking over the wall. They would respond to each other, even though they were six hours apart from when one was created. Or down here, drawing with friends. Someone would start a drawing. Any of you have done Exquisite Corpse, it's not that different. And pretty soon people are continuing these drawings. How do we, provide opportunities for us to do that. Be intentional. Intentionality. So the activity you did was something we have up in our atrium at the museum. And it says, draw more than dots. And we have up on the wall, big strips where you can draw and leave those behind. 
And it's extraordinary to see what people leave us. Incredible drawings. Some people will sit there for an hour working on something to just clip it and leave, which is fascinating because all the things you've seen me put up here, I think when we started doing this, people were like, yes, the children will love it. 60% of the people who participate in our connectors are adults. Adults need creativity too. They need the opportunity to practice these exact same skills. Children just do it much quicker, much easier.